Barshad, and we're here to talk to you about dialogic organization development. And uh, Bob, why don't you tell them where you invented the term dialogic organization development? Well, when we first started out and Jervis called me on the telephone and said, I think we're thinking about the same thing. We had never really worked together. And we began working on the idea that there were aspects of uh, organization development that were hidden uh, by the, the, the uh, official texts of the field and whatever else. And as we began to identify what is now in the book, it talks about the dialogic organization development mindset, we had to have a term. And as we were trying to get this published, and every time we came up with something about what the term should be for what we were coming up with, it got rejected. I talked about the new OD, Jervis talked about postmodern OD. We sent in uh, a, a draft into uh, the Journal of Applied Behavioral Science of classical and neoclassical, and that got rejected. And, and one night it came to me, well, the classical way is really diagnostic, and that was an aspect of what it was. And the new one had to do with, with language and emergent change and how people talk. And so dialogic is what came to mind. And I tossed it over to Jervis, and Jervis, your reaction was what? That was great. And, uh... And so we sent the exact same paper back in, but now we called it Dialogic and Diagnostic OD, and all of a sudden the editors loved it. We started winning awards, and, which kind of made the point we're trying to make in the chapter, which is that language matters, and that uh, the way you name things and the way you frame things has a huge impact on how you impact the world. And as uh, one of the editors of another paper we wrote said, you know, Dialogic OD is like all the three change processes you talk about. It's a generative image, it's disrupting the field, and um, and hopefully it, it, it'll create an opportunity and openness for a new story about what OD is to emerge. And I think also it ultimately helped us as we began to write and think. It's Once we had a new framework to put things in, we could fill it out. We were starting to be freed up from the old ways of thinking and so we had a new language, we had a new way of being and began to see a new direction for where OD is, drawing on many of the old principles but packaged in a different kind of a way. So that was kind of the beginning of it and the beginnings of what went into the chapter. And are there some other things you'd like us to comment well, on? One of the things I, I want to say with that is like, Dialogic OD was a great generative image, I think it is a great generative image, but one of the problems of it is that people who don't really read our stuff but think they know what it is think, oh, well, this is about dialogue. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not. Uh, in fact, if anything, we would not uh, promote that there's a certain way you want to talk or a certain way you want to listen. Or, um, and so there's nothing about Bohmian dialogue in any of our work for that. Uh, we really think you have to take people where they show up. Right? Yeah, it's, it's actually behind the idea is, and as Jervis says, people like to make it about it's just talking to each other. So people say, oh, I'm doing dialogic OD, and they're like, what are you doing? Well, we're, I put people and they have conversations. And for us, it's really a dialogic is a more encompassing term that in some ways begins to integrate complexity science with interpretive science and social constructionism and begins to be on seeing organizations in a different conceptual way as conversational systems and that you, just bringing people together to talk doesn't mean that they're going to come up with something new. It doesn't mean that it's going yeah. to be any different. It can just be telling the same story over again. So a, a dialogic change process involves other kinds of things in addition to that, and very much a dialogic mindset. Yeah, I'd amplify that by saying, like, uh, the research I was doing on appreciative inquiry, one of the things that I became fairly convinced of so when people used appreciative inquiry in a diagnostic OD kind of way, they really weren't getting much in the way of transformational change. And uh, I think one of the problems is people go off, they learn a course in appreciative inquiry or, or open space or future search, and then they apply it in kind of an ABC paint by numbers sort of way. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and they don't really understand why. And I think that that's what we're trying to understand is, well, when these things work, what's going on under the waterline? That's what, our, I think right. that's what our work's about. Yes. Um, one of the things that happened was we came up with the diagnostic versus dialogic. People wanted to put us into an either or box. Right. And the academics just look, you know, the academics look for a reason to criticize stuff. And that was the immediate criticism that came is that, well, you're creating a bifurcated world and isn't it much more complex and blah, blah, blah. And, 
uh, which was a good criticism. It forced us to really start looking at, well, what are we talking about here? Because we don't look at dialogic OD as a new technique. It's not a technique. It's not like, like here's the new method. It, and uh, that led us into what Bob eventually called the dialogic mindset. And that's been a much more fruitful metaphor for us. A way of thinking about and looking at things and, and a way of interpreting what's happening in the world. And, and just really, in many ways, looking at organizations and change and leadership through the eyes of, of the practice of organization development and the theories that, that impact organization development that were developed in the 1980s and 1990s as opposed to those that were developed in the 1940s and 50s, which is not to say that they are antiquated and, and no, no longer in use, but unless you separate them out and look at the world in, through those lenses, you're distorting what you're really seeing. And I think we felt that what really initiated it was a feeling that the field of OD was limiting its potentiality because it was force-fitting everything into a, a very important but classical way of seeing things. Yeah, but I'd also say that you can take a dialogic mindset and apply it to early OD technology. Like sure. you could apply it to socio-technical systems thing. You know, it's a way, so for us it's important to understand that dialogic OD isn't a technique, it's a way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And that there are, and that it's emerged as, as a whole lot of experiments in OD in the last 20 years have shown up. And so we, we point to 40 or so in the new book, you know, uh, OD technologies that are dialogic in nature. But I, to me, it's more about the mindset that you apply to those and you can apply them to any technique. So would you elaborate on what that mindset is? Well, that's, that's what's in the chapter. The chapter really kind of lays out what we think you know, are the key things that are similar about the ways people think who are being successful with this, these varieties of technologies. Uh, yeah, with, without replicating what uh, people will be reading in the, in the chapter, but just as a general idea, um, if I look at the world as being socially constructed through human interaction, and that means that organizations become not fixed entities, but the meanings that people make out of it. And that is meanings are conveyed through conversations and, and narratives. And that means that we're in a world of ongoing uh, iterations of what is. And so the world is in constant change and that we're always part of that constant change. And therefore, if you want to have real change, there are three things that you really need to do. Right. What we call the secret sauce in the book. And those are, uh, emergence narrative and generativity so and, and really each of those is a study in itself I think you know uh, we've learned a whole lot about it um, and continue to that's what's kind of exciting about it is but I think the dialogic practitioner whatever technique they're using they're looking through this lens of am I causing emergence here what is the disruption that's occurring and how am I being creatively disruptive in this process or and, and then you know what's the story what's the narrative that is animating the interactions that are taking place and what can we do to, to, to help people find a more adaptive story and finally what's, what, how is this process going to result in new ideas and new opportunities that didn't exist before the process could and that's generativity and uh, so those are the three kind of underlying secret sauce. Uh,